Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, well, thank you um, for this opportunity to talk about uh, autoethnographic ethics uh, and, and looking back on something that I wrote 10 years ago. Um, so I, I really uh, thank you for this uh, uh, chance to talk about this. And um, so I went to um, a, a, a World Congress in, in Urbana uh, in, uh, on qualitative inquiry in 2008. And it really is the preeminent uh, place for qualitative research in the, the world. And I, I went along not to present a paper, but just to learn what, what was happening uh, in qualitative research. And my, my background was in qualitative research. I'd written books on it. And also my other interest was in the sociology of ethics. And I was interested in, in relationships or, or, of tension between researchers and those they, that they researched between um, between ethics committees and researchers, between uh, the biomedical model and the social science model. So I was interested in, in ethics and I, and I went along and what I learned and at this Congress is everybody was talking about autoethnography and I didn't know anything about it. So I just threw myself into this uh, topic uh, and there were 43 articles uh, in spotlight sessions, 23 articles used it in their titles, 44 delegates um, used it, used the term autoethnography in their methodology. Plus there was two pre-conference workshops, uh, uh, one of them by Carol and Alice. And um, at the talk, they asked um, how many people here in the audience of 100 people were tenured faculty and about seven or eight of us put our hands up. So they were ma mainly postgraduate students. And I was listening to these talks. I was listening out for the technique what is autoethnography and what are the ethics of them? And I just didn't understand. I just couldn't hear people talking about ethics, especially when they started to include other people, their mothers, their fathers, their boyfriends, uh, into their um, topics. And so I, I wanted to, um, uh, I wanted to ask myself, how should postgraduate uh, postgraduate students writing an autoethnography best anticipate? ethical assurances on behalf of those written into their thesis. So the, the really um, important thing about autoethnography is that it connects the personal to the cu cultural, but I'm not too sure how, how big this personal actually is. When you read this one wonderful uh, reading by Connolly, uh, they really challenge the self-narrative writer. Do I own the story because I tell it? And I think I think um, they're asking the autoethnographer, I'm telling a story about my life, do I own it? And all the other people who come into it. Uh, and so in that, in that 2010 article that I wrote, I started to start to think about whether the, the word auto was a misnomer, that the self is uh, the focus of the research, but the self is porous, leaking to other uh, others uh, without due ethical consideration. And it's those other people that I'm concerned about and will be the focus of my talk today. So I got on a, I was in, in Urbana and it takes 36 hours to fly back to New Zealand. So on the way back to New Zealand, I wrote up 10 guidelines for those postgraduate students. So, and the first one was to respect participants autonomy, but actually that word participants is a bit, bit of a, a uh, misnomer also because they're not participating in your research, they're a subject of your research, but you need to respect their autonomy. Karen Alice's idea of process consent, you need to get consent ongoing all the way through the research. And the third one was my own idea, that this idea of going back and getting consent from your mother or father or lover or whatever, uh, fellow workplace members was, uh, in, in a sense, coercive, because if you go back to your mother and father and say, I want to write about my upbringing, um, they have a sense of obligation. And that, that, that I was saying was, was uh, what was tending to be co coercive. Others had said that you should consult a ethics committee. Um, Medford said, don't publish anything that you wouldn't show other persons. So I was just collecting what other people were actually saying about um, autoethnographic ethics. 
my own idea of internal confidentiality. If you're writing about uh, an autoethnography about your workplace, everybody else who's actually in that workplace is implicated and is actually identifiable uh, from what you're actually saying. So beware of internal confidentiality. And uh, another idea I had was that if you're talking, talking about something deeply personal, um, you may actually, for postgraduate students, be on a job market one day and actually have to talk about something deeply impersonal with these strangers who are interviewing for, for a job. It was just an idea that I had that you should think about. I also talked about photo voice uh, as being the, the exemplary ethics that anticipate ethics. And I'll come back and talk about that um, in, in, in a short while because that is the one guideline that I no longer support. The, the, the number nine was Jan Morse's idea was that if you, if, if you can't minimize risk to yourself or others in what you're writing, use a non plume and that will de-identify the whole thing, uh, both the person, persons are, are mentioned and you, yourself. And that's still a good idea. <clears throat> and and um, uh, n number 10 was to assume that um, uh, all people mentioned in the text will re read it, uh, it one day. So those are my 10 guidelines that I, that I wrote uh, basically on a plane uh, going back to New Zealand. And uh, I actually got that published in, a, in the qualitative health research in 2010. Um, and uh, the, the, the important thing here is this, uh, it's, it's uh, cited, I, th I think it's cited now by about, a, about 301 people. But I'm gonna be talking today about cited for, by 200, 291 people. So when Antonio asked me to um, give a talk, I said, oh, I wonder if anybody actually has read my article. Did it actually make a difference? Um, and then I find out that, uh, uh, 291 people have, have actually cited the article. So what I did, I had a postgraduate student uh, collect a table uh, of, of, of all the, the articles, uh, basically they're, 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 they're basically themes that they're talking about and actually what they actually said about me. So we have Tullus down here at number eight uh, in uh, Self and Others and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, they say that last line, while retrospective consent is less than ideal, I think calling this practice coercive lacks nuance. So people were people were were praising me and people were criticizing me. And I'll probably come back to that one quote uh, later on when we actually look at, at the nuances of what Tullus is actually saying and what what I've I've been saying here. So. How do these people, when I went through and did a coded analysis of these 291 papers, uh, the overall comments was that the, um, that the, the ideas were influential, that I actually made a difference. Those, those are the words they actually used. Others said that the guidelines were oppressive, hardline, kowtows to the university. And I found out that Coventry and Sheffield University and other ethics committees also, um, that although that they weren't named, were actually integrating my com my code of my code of uh, my ten guidelines into their code of ethics. Great thing about this 291 citations is that I got to my target audience. That 70 of the 291 were were uh, on the left hand column were actually uh, said that they were this was for for their PhD. So I actually provided recommendations for um, those postgraduate students who were, were in the audience with, um, with the, during those pre-conference workshops where people were talking about how wonderful and how expensive uh, and um, uh, autoethnography was but without actually talking about the guidelines that one actually practices. So I'm pleased that people picked up on this idea. Um, the specific comments that people had um, was that uh, people talked about process consent a lot. That you need to get process consent. You need to get consent all the way through. And that's Carol and Alice's idea. And I, 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 I cite her for that. People also talked about the, the problems with internal, with, uh, with uh, autoethnography in terms of internal confidentiality. Um, that if if you're identified, the people you're talking about, the, the, the relational people that you're talking about, they're also identifiable too. 
um, so that people were, were, were pleased to have that uh, pointed out to them. And people really talked a lot about retrospective consent as coercion and how difficult it was to get consent going backwards. Because the thing about uh, autoethnography is that the experience has all happened in the past. It's not in the future. I'm going to go and talk to 10 people and interview them about their workplace uh, satisfaction. That's something in the future, and I can anticipate those, those ethics. But if something's happened in the past, I'm writing about them, and I'm dragging people into my story, and it's difficult to get consent. So I'll talk about that uh, in my talk today. The one guideline that no one talked about was photo voice. And photo voice is just a brilliant set of ethical considerations because Carolyn Wang, she gives uh, a camera to, um, uh, to 12 year old kids in a, in a high school and says, go out and um, take photographs of, of, of your playground and find a risk in your playground, for example. And, but before you do that, here are some ethical issues that you need to don't take a picture of any person. Just take a picture of an image or a thing. Uh, so they're actually anticipating ethics. What I learned from going through these 291, and this is the main finding really, is, is going through these 291 citations is that autoethnography is retroactive. It's always looking back. And to say photo voice anticipates, autoethnographers don't, um, don't anticipate. They, they are looking back always. So I want to get rid of this notion of uh, photo voice. And um, I want to, um, I want to um, move to look at retroactive ethics and not anticipatory ethics and getting away from the focus on me, 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 me. It's my story, it's my story, it's my story. And do I own the story because I tell it? And the answer is no, you don't. Um, and I want to move to another uh, really emerging ethical concept that's coming out right, uh, well, it's been coming out the last 20 years now. Uh, it's called Nothing About Us Without Us. Nothing About Us Without Us focuses on the other. So I, I want to distinguish between the self, focusing on me, and focusing on the other. And by focusing on the other, we're actually looking at who's actually in this autoethnography. And let's focus on their rights. And uh, let's, so that's really what, what, I'm, that's what, I, what I'm talking about today. Um, James Charlton, uh, he wrote a book called Nothing About Us Without Us and expresses the conviction of people with disabilities that they know what is best for them. Um, and I, I think we need to move towards that way in autoethnography is that the people who are mentioned in our autoethnographies, they actually know what's best for them. And I, that's really, that's really the, paradigm shift that I'm talking about. If I created the paradigm with, with these guidelines, I want to shift that, par that, that paradigm from self to the other. And I think nothing about us without us is really what really uh, will happen here. So I want to take out the, the, the guideline number eight uh, on photo voice. It never, it never contributed anything, but it's brilliant uh, ethics anyway. And put in this idea of nothing about us without us and the 10 guidelines um, uh, remain the same, but we move from the self to the other. Okay, um, I was, I'm hoping that uh, people um, listening to this podcast at a later date may actually be wanting to um, do research on auto ethnographic ethics. And today I'll be talking about um, six or seven uh, questions that you might ask um, a, um, uh, the 291 people. Contact the 291 people and ask them these seven questions if you wanted to do research, and that would be a really good topic. Um, and that question, the first question is, when did people know that they were writing an autoethnography? I think if you're wanting to look at autoethnographic ethics, you need to know when we started writing an autoethnography, because I'm going to be telling you a, a little auto-ethnographic auto tale today, 
um, where I'm going to tell you that I didn't know that I was writing an autoethnography until someone told me I was writing an autoethnography. So that's where we're that's where we're heading today. So we're going to have seven questions coming up. <coughs> Please take them and use them. My own my own interests in the future are not in autoethnography. They're in big ethical moments, into mistakes. I'm really into trying to read and understand how qualitative researchers have had mis have actually been uh, made uh, mistakes in the field, have come across uh, 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 difficulties and how they've actually dealt with them. And that's, that's really what I'm writing about at the moment, not about autoethnography. So um, not all the 291 researchers uh, who wrote, who, who actually read my article and cited it, really uh, appreciated the article. And one, I'm gonna talk about one in particular, uh, uh, two in particular, but this is the first one. So one offered a feminist critique of the original paper, rightly noting that the article's exemplars featured only fe female autoethnographers. And they wrote, I'm intrigued by the role that gender might play in Tolich's arguments. Is it simply coincidence that the three, is actually five, autoethnographers that he critiques in this article are uh, all women, and she, uh, this this author is completely right. I, I focused on female um, auto ethnographers because those were the ones that um, that came up in a convenient sample rather than going after gender. In uh, and in red, I'll come across. I'll, I'll come back to the uh, notion of the issues that the person raises on the last three words: uh, survivors of violence. Um, at, at, towards the end of my talk. So um, what I want to do now is actually give a sort of uh, um, autoethnography of an autoethnography. And um, the, the, the main idea here is uh, to, to listen out for is when did this person, when did, when did me, and this is the autoethnography, when did, when did I actually know that I was writing an autoethnography? because it was not until really late in the piece when someone told me, you've written an autoethnography. Uh, so I, I want to uh, uh, give this, this is, this is not a great example of autoethnography, but it's a good example of a bad example. And uh, you can actually learn from it. And I, I think we need to be learning from our mistakes. Um, so um, let me, um, let me uh, just tell you a little bit about Outward Bounds and, and uh, is an organization in 30 countries. Um, and, and it really is a place where people go to um, have a continuous, set, a continuous set of adventures that would test each person's comfort zone. So you do hiking and hiking and swimming and uh, rowing and high wires and all these fear factor um, things. And, um, and it really challenges you. Before I went to Outward Bound, I put myself through a challenge and I challenged myself not to write about it. I said, do not write about this. I wanted to go to Outward Bound to experience Outward Bound, to be transformed by it. So my, my second um, uh, challenge was don't keep any field notes <sighs> because it was obvious to me, it was a total institution in a Goffman sense, total institutions transform people. I've done that. I wrote an article uh, 1995 about the horse racing stable as a total institution. And so I've actually done that. So I want, didn't want to do it again. I just wanted to be transformed by it. So I never collected any field notes. Um, but I um, wrote a book uh, last year uh, about a course that I teach on experiential learning. Uh, this is public sociology. Uh, this is sort of Burroway's, uh, Michael Burroway's idea of public sociology, how my students go out into the, into the public uh, and the public gives them a topic. And, um, and it is all about experiential learning. And the whole course is about experiential learning. And I wanted to write, I wanted to write, um, I wanted to write about my own experiences of experiential learning. And I wanted to, so I'm not going to go through this uh, all. Uh, so experiential learning at Outward Bound um, is 
that each hurdle you you go across is each task is more difficult than the previous one and that's what i did that that's what happens in my in my own teaching class the students have to go out and they have to go and meet the client and they have to uh, come up with a research design and then collect data and write the data all of those things are, are quite stressful on the students and i'm totally supportive of them and then they have to make a public they have to write a final report and they have to um, they have to make a public presentation and so all these hurdles so i wanted to write I said, oh, I've done experiential learning. I'll write, I'll write something about experiential learning. And I, where you take the confidence from one thing to the next. So, you know, I went to Albert Bound. Um, and the first thing, first three things that we did was swimming, sailing, and rowing. And, and these things were so easy to me. I grew up around water. So I was just like, oh, that's, that's easy. Rock climbing, rock climbing is really difficult, totally out of my comfort zone, uh, where I, where I was trying to use, I was trying to use my knees to climb rock climbing. And if you know anything about rock climbing, you don't use your knees, but I'm a big, a big guy. There were people, people right beside me, uh, climbing up a wall with blindfolds. They were actually doing it blindfolded. Um, so there was, there was, there was degrees of, um, uh, difficulty and mine was just getting over my knees so rock climbing and then high wires i i terrified of heights and this was way out of my comfort zone so i wrote about all of these hurdles because i wanted to share them with with my students about the experiential learning of going over hurdles and hurdles and hurdles um and the second to last day the second to last day that we were at this place we were there for eight days uh, on the second to last day, we got up at five o'clock in the morning and we went for a 20 kilometer ride in a tr truck and we climbed a two, two and a half thousand uh, meter mountain, Mount, Mount Sunday. And uh, we then, uh, when we started to come down about three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, by five o'clock it was dark and we were walking, we were walking through the bush uh, in, in the dark with our torches and, uh, and um, then we got back into our truck and uh, we were driving, we were silent, uh, totally exhausted from, 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 um, from, from the day's hike, uh, going back to Outward Bound headquarters. And then we arrived at Anakiwa, uh, which was the headquarters of, uh, I must, this was August, it was winter time, it was very cold, and it was midnight. And so I'm just going to show you a map of uh, Anakiwa. This is this is where we. This is this is where we lived. This is where we were going to have a lovely, lovely dinner, which I'm really looking forward to. And then I'm going to tell you about this this road here. We're over here, on this road, and we're coming down this road here, and in a truck at midnight. And then suddenly, we were going to turn into Anakiwa, but we didn't. We kept on walking, all, driving all the way down to here, and stopped the truck. We got out of the truck, and we were told to walk to the end of this uh, wharf here and uh, put on a life jacket and jump into the water. Um, and out, outward bound is a thing that you have to go swimming every day. And it, we didn't think that we'd, we'd have to go swimming at, uh, at midnight. So although I complained about jumping into the water, once I jumped into the icy water, I found the whole thing exhilarating. And uh, see, this is about me, me, me. This is all about me. Uh, and I jumped in for a second time. How wonderful, how brave I was. Um, it was me, me, me. and. Um, <laughs> if only the story had have ended there. If only the story had have ended there, but it didn't. Something amazing happened next. It was midnight, and I'm a sociologist, and I saw something, and I was just taken away. After I had jumped into the water for the second time, I noticed that not everybody had jumped into the water. Three people, I call them the conscientious objectors, inadvertently wrote themselves into a story I supposedly own. They wrote themselves into a story I supposedly own. As I said above, on each previous occasion, rock climbing, kayaking, walking the high wires, my focus had solely been on my experience, and now that changed. The story I was writing for my undergraduates changed, and I stated most of the uh, watch members had leapt, albeit reluctantly, into the icy water, but three members became conscientious objectors and refused to swim. 
So while my personal bravery at jumping in the water was important to me personally, it wasn't the plot line that the story about their experiential learning now, now followed. So these people jumped into my story. And what, what was really sociologically unique was that Irving Goffman talks about total institutions, how they transform people top down, but he also talked about it in asylums, how inmates can actually change the total institution. And here was, um, uh, so th th this wasn't an example of a total institution transforming individuals, but how individuals transform the total institution. So, um, and I started to write that into my story without really realizing uh, that these people were, I had moved from a story about me to a story about them. And what the, that's what was really interesting, but this was happening right in front of me. So I'm, answer, I'm answer, trying to answer that question for any, any postgraduate student who may be asking, when did you start to write an autoethnography? I hadn't started to write one yet. Uh, unbeknownst to my conscious self, a new plot line was now focusing on the conscientious objectors. For the moment, I was oblivious to these people's rights to their story. I failed to realize that I'd caused an ethical problem until I shared the, the, the story with my colleague. And my colleague had great delight, had great delight um, in telling me uh, what I was actually doing. To her credit, my colleague re recognized the form of my writing, the multiple plot lines, and took great delight in sharing with me an article that she had previously found quite useful. The article she shared with me was a 2000 foundational guidelines on autoethnography by Tolich. So <clears throat> she actually telling me that this was the moment that I realized that I was writing an autoethnography. Up until that point, I was writing about experiential learning for my undergraduate students, and that was put into a, the, the book that I, that I showed you pre previously. So, um, so I had a problem. I had a problem. Um, what, what, what do I do now? So um, I need to negotiate retrospective consent. And this is how I did it. And I think, it, I think it's really a useful, this is a really useful uh, process that I, that, I, that I went through here. First of all, I recognized but by just turning up to um, this one ringleader, especially the, the, the ringleader who actually led the conscientious objectors, if I turned up to th their house and said, um, <clears throat> I've written about you, can I, can I include your, your story in here? That would be coercive. They would feel through a friendship obligation to say, oh, yes, yes, that, that's fine. And I would have undermined their autonomy. I would have diminished their autonomy. Rather than do that, I went to my university and got ethics approval um, to actually go up to this person, to, go, to fly to another city, to go out um, in a rental car to, 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 to meet this person and interview them. Um, Right, I've got 10 minutes, I see. Um, so I, I'm, I'm gonna be finished within 10 minutes. Um, so I, I went out and um, I got, uh, I, um, <clears throat> I, I got their in, informed consent. And um, they, they said that, that they, uh, had the person said no, that paper, this, this, this thing, this autoethnography would have finished then. This is what the person said. It's a really great, and she's, talking onto a uh, tape recording, not into an autoethnography, but actually into an ethnography. This is an ethnography now. I do remember this bloody incident, she said. And if there's one thing I learned that I've taken with me is that I, I can say no and be prepared to accept the consequences of saying no and that the consequences sometimes aren't that bad. The truck stopped and I heard someone say, oh God, we're not doing that again. And I looked out and I, and I saw that bloody water and I just thought, I can't, I cannot. I hated that cold swim, I hated it. I couldn't see it did any good, hated it. And to me, it just brought, brought me down from my successful high that quick. I just don't have it in me. At that moment, I had had enough and I was so proud of myself that I'd got to the top of Mount Sunday and just it just all took it away. So this, this person is telling me, and this is, this is actually finally put into the paper. So how did I 
how did I deal with the, the, the 10 guidelines that now that I knew that I was actually writing an auto ethnography, what, what sort of guidelines did I follow? I recognized the coercive influ uh, influence of informed consent and I used a two step process. I basically went up and created an ethnography and I put her paper into a auto ethnography and I, I, I practiced process consent all the way through. And I sent her, when I, when I finished the article, I sent her the, the copy of it. I consulted with, with an ethics committee. So I was following some of that. And I anticipated the, my own vulnerability, my own ink, ink tattoo, that this personal transformation that took place at Outward Bound. I'm very proud of that. But that's probably all I did. The, what, what was the internal confidentiality? I was focusing on this one ringleader, but what about the other 10 people in the watch? I didn't follow that. Don't publish anything that you wouldn't show others. I, I didn't show it to the two team leaders who were actually running this, this, this group. So I wasn't actually following uh, all of my own guidelines here. So I've made mistakes here. Um, and I, the last one, that you, you need to assume that all people in the text will read it one day. So a team leader actually contacted me telling me that they'd read the article and they would have addressed the issue of resistance differently. I think that person was very embarrassed to be actually in this story. So I, I, um, so I, I apologize to, to them. Uh, did I consider using a non de plume? No, I didn't. Uh, that guideline wasn't followed. And my own idea now about nothing about us with, without us was, was not followed. Uh, I should have gone and actually got the approval of, or, or, or consent of all the people uh, in the story because they're all, they're all, uh, all there. So, um, so these are the research questions that, that someone could, could use uh, who wanted to, uh, when did the researcher first know that they were writing an autoethnography? In my case, it was very late in the piece. How many begin uh, autoethnography as free writing, not, not the publication? That was, that, was, that was my story. How many autoethnographic uh, researchers claim that they have been through ethics review? And when did they go through ethics review? And you'll see that in my case, it was late. Uh, how did the re researchers negotiate consent with those names before and after? That's process consent. And as you'll see, I've only uh, focused on what one of those persons, not, not all 10 of them or 12 of them. <clears throat> and where all people identified uh, in the auto ethnographic research consented, nothing about us without us. And the answer is no. So, uh, um, I did actually follow my own guidelines there, and I, I think those guidelines, if I had have actually realized that I was writing an autoethnography, what would have been actually quite, quite useful. Now, um, there's two other pieces to this, uh, this story, and I'm going to move on to this idea of uh, survivors of violence. Um, so, if, if a person is a survivor of violence, um, do they have to get the consent of the person um, who uh, assaulted them? And the, 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 answer, the, the answer to that one is, um, um, <laughs> let's see what I wrote in 2010. Uh, in 2010, what are the ethical considerations for those attempting to reconcile the rights to heal one's abuse with the ethical rights of those perpetrators who caused the harm, be their fathers, mothers, siblings, or spouses. Alice gives advice, but it's not clear. And I've, and I've, I'm, I've always been frustrated with the ethics that, that come out of uh, the senior auto-ethnographic um, researchers, uh, that they write, sometimes my requirement that my students get consent means that they cannot do a project that would help them heal and get on with life. And then I ask, is the well-being of the researcher always less important than the well-being of the other, even others who have behaved badly? Uh, I answered, no, not always. And I just don't find no, not always a very useful idea. And here in, uh, I wrote, here in lies the therapeutic pr promise of autoethnography. It's apparently unique, but as yet of substantiated belief, uh, benefit to heal the author as victim. So my sixth question is, you know, it's a, it's a very serious question that, that I'm going to ask here is, so, so some claim that autoethnographic research is therapeutic. If so, what is the status of that benefit as opposed to the risks? 
And I, I really think that any ethics always comes down to the benefit and the risk. And if you can't, if you can't say that there's going to be a benefit, there can't be any any risks. And I, I think I think there are ways to, I think there are ways to, um, uh, to to deal with this situation. And if consent would re-traumatize the person, then there are other ways. And I think um, that the idea that those unable to minimize risk to self or others should use a non-diploma is a really good idea. And for not novice researchers or PhDs, you can actually publish your, your uh, material, get a, comment, uh, a letter from your uh, editor, and that can go towards pr uh, your promotion. And no one needs to know that you actually wrote that article. So a non-diploma is a way to, to, um, to actually address this, this issue. Uh, and I, I think it's the best issue. Uh, it, it is the best solution. And it's Jan Morse's idea, not mine. So I really ended up with sort of revised guidelines from self to others and adding in number eight, nothing without us, with, with, nothing about us or without us would really have changed my own uh, auto ethnography that everybody in that story had rights. So um, getting to the end. Um, two more slides or three more slides I think. Um, so I'm moving from self to the other. Uh, in some auto ethnographic research is retroactive. It, it doesn't anticipate. We need to move away from the self. Do I own the story and actually focus on the others and the people that turn up in my um, story. So now I want to look at one, one of the other uh, citations, number eight in my um, um, uh, no, before I do that, I'll ask this one more question. It's a really important question. Um, in the original paper, I wrote that the auto is a misnomer. The self uh, might be the focus of the research, but, it's, but other people come into the story. And I'm just wondering, the, the real important research question is, is autoethnographic research unique? Should its ethical considerations be considered on a continuum of ethnography, not autoethnography? And in, in terms of ethnography, we do fo focus on participants. People do participate; they're not subjects. And I, I think, I think when I look at one, the last criticism that I'll, I'm going to put up here um, is by Tullus, um, who um, who thinks that while retrospective consent is less than ideal. I think calling this practice coercive lacks nuance. Okay, we're up. Okay, um, just to um, one of the 291 um, citations was from Tullus, who who really focused on um, the the idea of retrospective consent was less than ideal that it lacks nuance and I and I, I I've, I've read what they've said and I don't understand um, the what they mean by nuance and I'm and I'm again focusing solely on postgraduate students who might be wanting to follow what what Tullis means by nuance and this is what um, Tullis writes the, the prescriptive nature of informed consent, is um, is frequently carried out now. Uh, I'm sorry, start again. The pre pre prescriptive nature of informed consent, as frequently carried out now, is impractical for many research situations. So, impractical is the nuance here, and uh, let's understand that. Uh, consider, for example, when Tullus was conducting research with hospice patients. Um, well, I don't understand why this is autoethnography, or why this is autoethnography when it's really ethnography if you're doing research with hospice pay patients. There were times when the sit setting was laden with sadness as family members surrounded their loved ones bed praying or saying their final goodbyes. And I'm just wondering, is this sort of a, a place that one wants to do research uh, with this highly vulnerable people? Um, I don't know. Again, what is the nuance here? So what is the solution that Telus gives us? I, I, found this, uh, I, I found that this was the least appropriate time to explain my study and ask for consent. 
When possible, I waited for more suitable opportunities to engage in this process or opted not to do it at all. So um, this is a senior researcher who's telling postgraduate students, well, you can, you can get consent or you, you don't have to get consent. So I'm, I'm, still, I'm still back in those um, rooms in, um, in Urbana, listening to senior academics giving advice to uh, postgraduate students and wondering what are their ethical recommendations. And here is, uh, you, you can opt not to do it at all. So I'm, I think my guidelines still follow up. So um, that's the final slide. If, if only I had have gone to Anakiwa and it was a sunny day uh, and it was in the summertime, I wouldn't have written this paper, but because it was, um, because it was um, the middle of winter and it was icy cold uh, and these people refused to take part in their, um, uh, Take, take part in this swim and good on them. And, and they show gr far greater bravery than, than, than I did. But what I've also started to show in this, um, in, in this presentation today is that you can learn from mistakes. I've made mistakes uh, and hopefully other people may uh, learn or also learn from, from those mistakes too. So thank you for this opportunity to go back and review um, this, um, these 291 citations uh, and, and to sort of see what, what people um, have said about this paper that I wrote. Did I make a difference? I think I did. And I'm really pleased about that. So now I'll take any um, questions or comments that people have. Okay, thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. Uh, we have two questions. Uh, one is from our colleague Lucimara in Brazil. And uh, she was with us yesterday and she was asking, in Brazil, it is common to use the experience report method. What is the difference between autoethnography and reporting experience? Well, I don't know, I don't know the, re the reporting experience um, uh, method, uh, so I, I, I can't comment on that. Is there, a, is there an example of a reporting experience? Mm, I don't know if uh, Pedro can assist you with that. I'm not no. familiar with the concept. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, okay. because I don't but know. I, but I, but I, I, would say, I would say that I, I'm a tremendous fan of Van Manen uh, and his book called Tales of the Field. Where he, where he talks about different ways to begin a, uh, a manuscript, uh, a thesis or a, or a book by describing one's experience. And I, I think describing one's experience is, is a wonderful way to, to actually establish one's, um, one's research question. And uh, so I, I think reporting one's uh, experience um, hmm. is useful. But, as long as it's but 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 as but as long as it's your experience, if we're sitting if we're sitting in a in a hospice and uh, we're conducting research with hospice patients, we're not talking about our experience. We're talking about their experience, or, or and I and I and I and I'm really confused about what is and what is not uh, autoethnography. So I, I would I would tend to think of. Um, that our experience should be sort of seen if other people are mentioned that we're thinking of it in terms of an ethnographic um, study. I, I have a question, uh, Sonia. Sure. Uh, Martin, uh, our ethnography deals with bias. How are you deals with bias? Bias. Yeah. And are you interviewing people? <laughs> No, in the auto ethnography studies, because so, you you deep you talk about you, I talk about me, but it's um, subjective field, yeah, um, uh, and the qualitative research uh, means or when I talk uh, um, with other research, uh, I talk about subjectivity. Uh, how, 
how I, uh, and people ask me, Pedro, uh, how you deal with bias in the when you analyze the qualitative data? Uh, and I, when I see your presentation, I think how um, Martin deals with the, with, uh, deals with um, with bias in auto auto ethnography. All right. So that that is my own that is my own perspective. Only this. <laughs> You're okay. Sonny. I don't know if, if Martin was uh, asking something or, or were you asking? Yeah, no, uh, I, uh, you, were, um, you were asking from your own perspective, is that it? Yeah, so uh, I want to know, uh, so uh, has he seen bias in my presentation today? No, 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 but but uh, I don't understand because oh, when uh, I know ethnography studies, because I work with the, the community, I see other people, I study other people, uh, but uh, when I work about myself, I think in bias because uh, all days when I work with um, uh, young research, the problems in your mind is bias. For me, it's not a problem. But uh, and I remember how uh, you deal uh, with auto ethnography with bias. Uh, is um, a question in my in my brain. <laughs> I, mm, mm, uh, mm, mm, mm. Well, I, I I don't know. I don't. Know. I, I'm not an auto ethnographer, so we we perhaps need to get an auto ethnographer here. Okay. As you see, I've, I've only written one, and I didn't even know that I was writing it. So uh, uh, until someone okay. told me that I that I that I was. Okay, I tried to find it, and I I talked with you. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have another question from Isabel Pinu, who was with us just uh, a while ago, but she well, we couldn't get in the session again. When does a personal and subjective subject become a relevant research object? Yeah, that, that's, an, that's another question about autoethnographic research. And, and my talk is not about autoethnographic research. Uh, mine, mine, mine is about the ethics of, of, of doing uh, autoethnographic research. But I, I do think, um, I do think, going back to that Van Manen story that I told, told before, I do think that we can learn, um, we, can, we can establish a, a research question by drawing on personal experience um, in, a, in a very, very useful way. So we, we, we can use the subjective. And as, as long as you get to the end of the research question and say, well, that's my experience, is that everybody else's experience too? Um, and that, that actually goes out and challenges the bias or, or the subjective nature of what your own experience. Okay. Any more questions? Mm -hmm.